uh, Wi-Fi connected mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode. And just, uh, Melissa said, everybody just make sure your phones are way enough from the microphones. And I don't know how it will reflect with the uh, what's the spotlight system, which is in process, but we do that as well. Uh, Pat has passed his apologies. And are we any other apologies? I haven't heard from Jim. No. Okay. Uh, members are declare any relevant financial or other interest to the committee meeting as applicable. Jim, your usual. Yep. And four members, uh, the draft minutes of the meeting on the 24th of June are at page four. Members, are we content with the draft minutes or an accurate record of the proceedings? Are we agreed? Yes. Agreed. And agreed the minutes will be published on the website. Content. Uh, matters arising, consideration by the Chancellor of a temperature reduction in VAT. At the meeting of the 24th of June, it was agreed to return to this issue and consider the implications of extending any reduction to VAT to Northern Ireland at this meeting. Uh, you'll notice from the Hi, Paul. You'll notice um, from the minister's remarks yesterday when I asked him the question about uh, VAT, and I think it was a response maybe to something that Matthew said, it's an issue that is being raised. One of the items that will come up as we come through is the chairs of the Scottish Assembly uh, or the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh, I think it's now Parliament because they've rechanged their name, uh, asked us to write collectively to uh, the Treasury to ask to make sure that issues of that and things like that would be being considered. Uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll take that, we'll take that business as now, Jim. But I think we have agreed to send that letter, but I would like your approval to send that letter along to the Minister as well, so he knows our position, and that would be quite useful. If we could record that, please, Jim. Uh, we move on now to the written evidence, the in-year monitoring outcome of the June Monitoring Round Public Spending Directive. Uh, the clerk's paper is on page 15. Just check that and make sure I've got that. Yeah. Uh, departmental response is at page 17. Ministerial statement is tabled at page 3. June monitoring responses from the committee are from pages 22 to 289. Uh, this includes response from the committee for the executive officer office to request the TO for information on budget scrutiny issued on the 23rd of April, and was received by the committee for the executive office on the 22nd of June. Two months. Additional information received by the Committee for Justice at table at page 45. June monitoring round information for the TO, which was received by the Committee for the Executive Offices on the 26th of June, is tabled at page 57. And the departmental response with additional financial scrutiny information is page 330. Um, I would like to inform the members that in reviewing content of the returns prior to the scrutiny committees by some departments, there appears to be some inconsistency of the amount of detail being provided. I would like to advise the members the committee will be able to explore these issues with officials during oral evidence next week. I would like to say that due to the timing of responses to the committee for the executive office, that committee will not have had an opportunity to undertake scrutiny in relation to the original budget or the executive office June monitoring round to the Department of Finance, which I think is, would be deemed by us to be a matter of interest and concern. I would like to refer your members to paragraph 9 of the clerk's brief, page 16 of the PACs, engagement with the Assembly Committees. Let me just have a, look, a quick look at that. Say page 16. Uh, page 16 of the papers, table, table not papers. the table papers of the. Should be 16 of 733. Let me know when you've got it, Matthew. 15, I have. 9. And I think the sort of. Para 5.91, where the Department of Finance recommends the committee should be kept informed of financial matters on an ongoing basis. It's of interest. And again, because of the executive department and the executive committee, how could they manage to have done that? Sorry, what? Page 16? Page 16. Not in the table papers. 
uh, most of the papers. Oh, right. And it should be 16 of 733. That should be your clue. You're on the right page. You got it, uh, Matthew? Yes, thanks. Okay. Let me know when you've got it, Melissa. Page 16, um, then you're monitoring guidance for the department of something made, no? Yes. Yep. And of course, the view we're seeking is in order to support the minister and officials given the Department of Finance's role in coordinating the monitoring round process. I just wonder if we would like to suggest that the committee writes to the First and Deputy First Minister to outline the role of the scrutiny committees in monitoring the performance of their respective departments, and that so that we can seek an assurance that in future the Executive Office will adhere to the in year monitoring guidance issued by the Department of Finance, which I think would be appropriate. And if we're not setting if the department, the executive uh, department or committee are not set, oh, sorry, it's been a long day already. If the TEO are not setting the right tone, how can I expect the other uh, departments to do the same? So I would like your agreement uh, to seek a response to the issues identified in the clerk's brief consideration along the oral evidence next week. Oh, sorry, I think we should. I would like us to write to the first and deputy first minister. To outline, re-emphasise, outline the role of scrutiny committees in monitoring the performance, and I think we should do that if we are agreed. 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 Yeah. And uh, seek your agreement to uh, seek a response on the issues identified in the clerk's brief for consideration alongside the oral evidence at next week's meeting. Are we agreed? Any comments? Um, Move on to the next the oral evidence rates relief, also university economic policy. Can we invite Gareth in? Come on in, Gareth. You might like to take your jacket off. It's rather warm in here. Make yourself comfortable. We're not going to bite. <laughs> oh, yes, we are. <laughs> thank you. Gareth, first up, um, just before I sort of brief the team, thank you very much indeed for what is a very comprehensive piece of work. And I think it's helped inform a lot of the sort of both the decision making process, but it's given us a greater understanding of where we're sitting at the moment and sort of the implications that are likely to affect. Northern Ireland PLC as a whole. So from that, take that from me as the chair of the committee. Thank you very much indeed for the hard work and the endeavour you've done. Uh, the relevant papers, the clerk's briefing paper team is at page 341. Uh, the paper to the executive rates relief is on page 343. The committee for the economy survey response to businesses who couldn't access COVID-19 funding supports on page 338. And the committee for the economy, the need for partnership to rebuild the economy is at page 423. Gareth, could you make an opening statement, please? Thank you, Chair, for, uh, for your comments, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chair, it's my understanding that it's the preference of the committee. I keep my opening statements reasonably brief. You have my, yeah. you have my report to allow most time for, um, uh, for, for questions. And also, thank you for sending through the correspondence from the Economy Committee. Uh, which I thought was broadly consistent with what was in uh, my own research. So, uh, we're, we're tr just so you're aware, Gar, we're trying to get a joined-up approach between as much across um, the all the assembly committees, but most importantly, we want to be able to get a coordinated approach that we deal with sort of the real crisis in hand, and being able to understand that. And it's not just an issue for finance; it's a cr it's a cross-cutting issue, and this is why it's quite important. Yeah, no, and thank you, and I agree. I think it's I, I call it a whole of government response is what's required to to, to be this, and we can uh, we can discuss that at length. So, my opening brief comments then, just firstly, uh, the remit. Um, that was given to me was to provide economic advice and insight, uh, particularly at the sectoral level, uh, to identify priority areas for the ongoing business rates relief um, beyond the initial three-month blanket relief that had been given to, um, to all businesses from April to, to June. Um, a couple of points just to set context. 
Um, so all parts of the economy have been impacted um, by uh, COVID-19 and will continue to be impacted. Um, but some parts uh, have been more impacted than others. And given that we obviously have a finite budget, there isn't limitless money, um, I suppose I, I was brought in really to identify which areas in, in terms of rates relief could benefit from it most. Um, and, and that was, uh, and, and I suppose that's, and, and I'm, I'm conscious because as, as someone who is undertaking the research as, as public uh, representatives, you will all be lobbied by individuals and businesses that have been impacted. Everyone's been impacted. So, so that was one important point. I think the, the second important point, just by way of context, is that business rates is, is primarily a revenue raising tool. It's not an economic development uh, lever. And, and so it's quite a blunt instrument in, mm -hmm. in terms of yeah. you're wanting to try to grow the economy or, or, or move as we move into uh, the recovery phase. So it's also very important to, to consider the wider economic supports that have been put in place, both locally by, uh, by the Assembly and the Executive and also nationally. Um, in, in terms of, I suppose I had a, there was a principle that I had in mind uh, when I was thinking about um, targeting the re relief beyond the initial period. And the principle that I had in mind was, if government restrictions prohibit a trade or prevent a trade at a viable level on a business, then it was inappropriate for government to levy rates on that business. And so that was kind of the, at the back of my mind when I was thinking about uh, areas which uh, would, would most merit ongoing um, relief. In terms of my approach to the research, um, I, I suppose there was two elements to it, really quantitative and qualitative. On the quantitative, we used data as much as, as possible from uh, the ONS in the UK, the CSO in, in the Republic, and then also some work that had been undertaken uh, locally um, to, uh, to, to gather information again on the sectors that would be most impacted. That's on the quant side then, on the data side. On the qualitative side, I, I consulted with a range of, of business organisations, so individual sectoral organisations and cross-sectoral uh, organisations, I suppose to try to understand the specific uh, challenges and issues that, that those areas um, were, were facing. And some of those organisations had also carried out their own surveys of, of members yeah. um, and, and they used that. And again, that's in, in, in the report. Um, so then finally, just uh, by way of identifying uh, some of the highest priority areas, uh, one of the things that came through very clearly in the consultations was that it will take some time for businesses to return to I don't want to call it normal levels of trading, but even reasonably normal levels of trading, it isn't something that can just happen at, at the flick of a switch. And so therefore, uh, a short grace period, if you like, beyond the three month blanket relief uh, could, be, uh, could be justified. And you'll know, Chair, and your, your, your members will know the highest, uh, I, I suppose the, I had the highest priority and then high priority. Mm -hmm. The highest priority were hospitality, tourism, leisure, airports, and, and childcare. And, and I think one of the things that struck me particularly about those highest priority uh, sectors were that the actual viability of the sector is, is potentially in question. It's not just will some businesses uh, fail here. You know, we're going to see businesses fail across all sectors, but actually the viability of the sector could be significantly impacted. And then we also have then what I identified as high priority sectors, so uh, the non-food retail uh, manufacturing, construction, and, and other parts of transport. Um, so to, I will, uh, I could go into individual sectors and give an overview, but I, I'll allow members to ask questions, and I'm quite happy to to take any comments. Gareth, I'm going to sort of kick off and sort of, you know, we've been having conversations over years through chambers of commerce and various other issues, and you know, we've been sort of spent a lot of time talking to like Richard Ramsey and other people to do with that. Is there, you know? Is there anything that has really surprised you during your analysis that has really s stood out that we didn't really know beforehand? Because we, we always understood that sort of the particular vulnerabilities we had, but is there some areas that, um, and you've identified the sort of the, the very high priorities of critical areas, but have you seen something in your analysis that sort of has, has shown where we are particularly vulnerable? Um, to this pandemic? Yeah. Um, I, and, and, and I know, and I look, I know that other members will come in here because 
you know, we're looking at a pandemic pr problem, but we've also got another problem that's going to start on the first yes. of uh, first of uh, January. So there is for business out there. They're not seeing this as one problem or another problem. They're seeing this as a whole combination of issues. But what, what, what are the kind of things that have stood out for you? Yeah, I mean, I think that, and it's actually we're starting a piece of work now to, to look at uh, recovery and how long do we think it will take to come back to pre-COVID levels of economic activity and, and employment. Mm -hmm. and You've been invited to join the economic policy advisory group? Or the or? EAG. I'm not part of the group, but... Um, uh, we work with the Department for the Economy, who work with EAG, and we will be okay. feeding into to their work. Um, so, uh, as part of that work that we're doing, how long it will take to get back to, to recovery, uh, I think that when we look at some of the sectors that have been most impacted by this, so retail, hospitality, uh, Aerospace. Northern Ireland is overweight in aerospace. That yeah. has been up until now a good thing. Advanced manufacturing, high-skilled uh, jobs. Um, those are areas of the economy and our labour market where we are have a higher concentration. And those are sectors of the economy that are going to take longer to come back to normal than other areas of the economy in, in other in the rest of the UK or in, in the Republic, for example. So there, there are reasons for us to um, – there are some areas of our economy which are more vulnerable relative to other parts of the UK and indeed other parts of Europe. I think that would be uh, the, the first point that I would make. The second point that I would make is – and again, this is, a, this is usually a good thing – we have a relatively young demographic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which is usually a positive from an economic perspective, but when we look at the groups of who are going to be most impacted by this, in, in the, not just in the immediate term, but in the medium to long term, you're looking typically at younger people, particularly those who are leaving the education system, and also the lower skilled. And whilst Northern Ireland has very two sides to its education system, for, for some people, the education system works particularly well, and we get higher grades than the rest of the UK. But similarly, there's other parts of the education system where uh, we still feel very significant numbers of, of young people. And uh, particularly those, uh, those young people uh, who um, may leave the education system with low or no levels of qualifications, they're going to find it incredibly challenging. Uh, to move into what is going to be a very difficult labour market, um, because what tends to happen is people, graduates, young, young graduates, if they enter the labour market and there aren't graduate level jobs, they move into lower skilled jobs mm -hmm. and, so, and, and down the, the, the ladder, as it were. So younger people with lower no skills, the jobs that they may have gone into have been taken by people with, with higher level skills. So those would be two points. Um, that, that I would draw out in, in terms of vulnerabilities that the Northern Ireland economy uh, would have relative to the rest of um, other parts of the UK and, and indeed other parts of the developed world. Mm. <clears throat> and just before I move on, but uh, rates relief in itself is a fairly blunt instrument. Correct, yes. So, you know, we've had three months to think about what we're, we should be looking to change. So if you, through your analysis and because you're looking at the recovery, and I think it's very opposite that you're able to come here and say that you're doing this next piece of work, is there anything you're able to drag through from the analysis you've done already that some areas we should be focusing on and looking at? Because, of course, we're, we've just had the June monitoring round. Yes. We will be looking at another monitoring round, presumably in September. And at that stage, we'll have a better shape of sort of the impacts on the economy. And hopefully it's not as bad as you know, is being expected with unemployment maybe heading up towards 14 per cent or something like that. But at that stage, we should have a, a better view. Have you, begin, have you begin to see some other sort of issues that we should be looking at, and uh, particularly if there's any fiscal levers we should be starting to think about? Uh, yes, uh, Chair, we have been given some thought to this. Right, I think just a, a brief word on rates. You, the rate, business rates is not a policy to, to base economic recovery on. Yeah. I think what we saw as uh, the, the, the business rates piece was, for some sectors, it could be the difference between uh, businesses being able to stay in business 
uh, through this uh, this period of, of, of lockdown and, and subsequent restrictions and pushing them over the edge. But it's not it's not a, a policy tool that will form the basis of any sustainable long term uh, recovery. In terms of what else do I think um, uh, we or you as a as a government or uh, an executive and, and holding the executive to account? Um, there's a number of tools we see this quite frequently: accelerating infrastructure investment. Uh, and indeed, that the Prime Minister uh, made mention of this in, in his remarks um, yesterday. Um, that, that gets money into the economy quickly. Uh, we also have a quite a, a, a strong construction sector, so that is work that could be undertaken by local firms. Uh, it's uh, and in turn creating and, and maintaining local employment. That also creates demand for apprenticeships and, uh, and, and jobs for young people who are leaving the education system. So there's a number of things. Infra Economists like infrastructure investment. It's a good thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It gets money into the economy quickly. But then also in the longer term, it makes uh, the economy more productive. So therefore, it has both short term and, and longer term uh, benefits. Something else, and, and I haven't heard this, I've heard it talked about in the abstract, but not necessarily uh, specific to Northern Ireland. One of the impacts of um, the, uh, this, this uh, pandemic is um, there will be a desire for businesses to uh, shorten and simplify their supply chains. So six months ago, who knew that being reliant on China for face masks was something that we needed to be concerned about? Mm. So there will be this review and thinking around um, how, how it's not just about lowest cost, but it's also resilience of supply chain. I think there's an opportunity for Northern Ireland here uh, through Invest NI to set itself up as a potential location for foreign direct investment that would historically, from whether it's from GB, the US or, or, or Europe, that would have historically gone to the Far East. Uh, that, that we could potentially get a, a, a share of that, um, and, and those also, that, and that's important in terms of creating. Um, it's not just manufacturing jobs, but manufacturing jobs, and why manufacturing jobs are important is because manufacturing sector creates employment across the entire skill spectrum. So. Um, we've seen increased demand, for example, and even some job announcements in, in the IT sector and cyber security, which is fantastic. Absolutely, we should be going after those sectors and, and, um, and, and attracting them here. But with the best will in the world, not everyone has the wherewithal or the aptitude to, to work in those uh, sectors. One other, there, there are a number of things I could talk about here. I suppose one other thing I would say, and it goes back to your initial point around uh, this whole of government uh, response, is. Uh, I think that we need to look at job centres and jobs and benefits offices because uh, the, the, the challenges that they faced three months ago, we had record levels of employment, we had a buoyant labour market, we had record low levels of unemployment. So in essence, they were dealing with relatively few people and they were dealing with a labour market mm -hmm. that was creating lots of jobs. That's going to flip. They will be moving to a situation where uh, they're going to be having to deal with lots and lots of more clients mm -hmm. and a much more challenging uh, labour market. And that, so there's a very important role for job centres, jobs and benefits offices, moving those people into the labour market and how they are tooled up for that in effect. So um, that's, and now there, there may be work ongoing there. We, uh, we do not engage that often with DFC, Department for the Communities. Uh, but that's something that I, I would highlight as, a, as something that certainly the executive should be thinking about in the assembly. Thank you. And just before I bring a couple of other people in, I mean, the idea of reshoring for resilience and the issue about increasing resilience in across the United Kingdom for some strategic areas is an idea that I think should have more currency. And again, it's something that I think the regions themselves should be bidding quite heavily for. And we've, we've seen the likes of O'Neill's uh, sort of rapidly repurposing for sort of PPE. But we've also seen how sort of the life, many of the life sciences companies could be looking at sort of generic manufacturing within Northern Ireland, and there's opportunities there. But you've said something, and uh, some of us have a particular view about Invest NI and what Invest NI has been doing over the last couple of years. 
uh, Invest in I should be, in many respects, investing in Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland companies and making them more competitive rather than looking at the opportunities to bring people in all the time. So that is a, a change really in the culture. I'm not trying to put words into your mouth because I'm definitely not. But do you see that as a change in culture, particularly within Invest in I, but also in how we go about um, building resilience into the economy? Well, I, I suppose there's a, a couple of points that I would make in, in respect of that. Um, resilience is something that would have been talked about historically, and the, the low cost was the priority, and resilience would have been, yes, but we have very efficient, effective global supply chains. They've been working perfectly well. You know, so you, you, it was an argument you, were, you weren't going to win. You ha it, it had to fail for the resilience yeah. argument to come, uh, to come to the fore. So in, in that respect, I think we're now um, pushing on. What the, I don't know if the door is open, but it's unlocked. Yeah. <laughs> I would put it like that. Um, that that's, the, that's the first point. In terms of the culture within Invest NI, I, I mean, I think you're right. I and mean, we haven't done a review of Invest NI, so I, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not able to comment on this in, in too much depth, but certainly there is this balance between wanting and needing to bring investment in from overseas mm -hmm. and uh, also the needing to support a, a broad range of indigenous uh, companies. Um, Invest NI have, in, in terms of indigenous companies, they have tended to focus on high growth export orientated um, businesses. If your question is, should they move away from that? Um, well, in, in terms of local economic development, there's the role that councils also have in that regard. So, is there, excuse me, is there scope for Invest NI and, and local government to work more closely together uh, in that potentially? Uh, I, I I'm, I'm not in a position to, to give an no, authoritative view on that. It's just that, again, one of the things we're talking about resilience, but in sort of West Tyrone, you know, that's uh, Malusia's uh, neck of the woods, there is a very large ecosystem of small micro-engineering companies. Yes. But micro-engineering companies, if they became sort of uh, grew in size to small engineering companies or even medium engineering companies, that gets us into an entirely different economic structure and really is a, a growth engine. We, um, we did some work last year with Invest around clusters policy and looking at the potential, I mean, in effect, um, you know, businesses that operate as part of a cluster are, are more efficient. In fact, you know, they're, they're, they're better businesses than businesses working in isolation and economies that have lots of clusters are more successful economies. So um, I do know that that cluster policy is something that Invest NI are have started to look at uh, whether that could potentially be ramped up in areas for success. You know, some targeted sectors that would offer the greatest potential for uh, for further growth. Um, to, I know it's, I'm going to go off on a, a slight tangent here, but um, as government, we have the potential to spend money on let's call them infrastructure projects. One comment that small and micro businesses would use is that it's very difficult for them to get into and access. Um, the, the, the tender to win tenders effect for, for large uh, government uh, procurements. Um, there, there may be scope for <clears throat> larger businesses, the, the, the larger businesses that have the resources to bid for large public procurements, to use these smaller businesses in, as part of their supply chain or as subcontractors. There may be need, and again, there's maybe scope to talk to Invest in about this. Do those smaller businesses uh, need help to link with the larger businesses as part of an overall um, procurement or team to bid for procurements? Yeah, and they probably want to be in the position where if they don't win a contract, they immediately get JR'd by the bigger company. Sorry, Paul. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, very, very informative. Can I ask a question around the, the supply chains? Because Suppose we're in a position now whereby even the work of this committee is being obstructed uh, because the Minister and Department say that they, to some degree they have to uh, balance transparency and accountability of their department with uh, companies in China uh, who are looking in and are very sensitive. 
that seems to me to be a very precarious place to be. And, and if you're compromising transparency and accountability of, of a government department, then it's a very bad place to be. Um, but it seems to be that other jurisdictions, even in our own islands here, are positioning themselves, as you've talked about, with regards to local supply, uh, making sure that those are assured supply lines and not have to travel across the world. It seems to be the case that the Scottish Government has established a new NHS Scotland supply chain and adopted what they call a buy and make strategy. Uh, do, do have you any uh, information on that strategy? Is it something that's hit your radar? Uh, I don't. Ha I don't have anything specific on that. But uh, one thing that I am uh, that, and I have thought for some time, is that governments spend a lot of money, mm -hmm. and um, to date, uh, and as someone who has sold services into government. Um, I, I would, I would argue that there is one determining factor, uh, factor, and that is price. Full stop. And the whether it's the quality of the service or, or the quality of of the product, I'm not saying it's unimportant, but it seems to come secondary to the price. And it's perhaps the case that um, medical goods that are manufactured. Uh, off these islands, I'll put it like that, are a lower cost than goods manufactured here, um, and the, the the quality differential that may exist isn't necessarily given uh, appropriate weighting. So, given the um, now, of course, we also have to recognise that the the health service have very tight budgets. They need to operate. They need to deliver value for money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, it's not. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not an easy uh, problem um, to, to solve. But nevertheless, um, given the scale of public spending and the, and the purchasing power of government, there is um, there is the opportunity there to help use that purchasing power uh, to help support economic development moving forward. Yeah. Can I ask just then? Uh, <coughs> would it take a, a change in the law? Or tendering procurement practices and procedures and law uh, legislation around procurement, in order in order that we would negate the lowest price only mindset uh, and factor in all the different arts and parts as you've described with regards to assurance and with regards to safe supply and and also you, you could even justify it as, as as including wealth creation for your people. Uh, is, is that allowed at present, and would would that take a change in the law? Uh, so, Chair, I, I'm I'm not a procurement expert or or lawyer, so I I, I, I wouldn't want to say yes or no <laughs> to that. But what I can say is that within procurement, okay, we just quote you anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> within within procurement um, process, there is the opportunity, or you, you, there there is a waiting given to price and a waiting given to quality. And there is scope that, that, to the best of my knowledge, that that waiting is not fixed or set in in law. Um, and the the the, uh, the purchaser has the the ability to to vary that depending on the nature of the good or service that they're wanting to procure. So um, there could be potential for. Um, a, a greater weighting to be given to either the quality of the good or service, and how do you define quality could come into um, resilience of supply. It could bring in other factors um, in addition to just simply, is this a good pencil or not? Um, th there may be scope to do that, so there's certainly potential to explore that, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Matthew. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, um, Gareth, for coming in and giving this evidence. Um, just for the purposes of us understanding um, Sort of make sure what we're talking from the, the correct principles. Um, the the slide deck you provided us is essentially the advice that you gave to the executive, um, which uh, and then you at uh, the annex you have an, annexed are the list of options that you basically provided. C would you say? Could you give us a, a sense of which of those options is closest to the one that the executive pursued? 
So it was, um, I think I have it listed as... It's Annex 3. Yes, um, I think it's option 3. I think I'll just... Um, oh, no, sorry. Yeah, so option 5 then. Um, yeah, so it's option 5. So it's the, there were a number of different... Whenever we were going through this... Um, I understand Mr. Bronte is joining you after my evidence session. So uh, he, he's the expert in the rate system. I've been brought in to provide um, economic advice. Um, and the, the, the rating system um, doesn't necessarily, it doesn't easily identify yeah. different sectors. And so um, we, we looked initially at, well, is there a way in which that this could be easily implemented? Uh, and so we came up with lots of different options yeah. where, for example, with businesses that have already received the £10,000 grant, the £25,000 grant, the, you know, the, in many respects those have been targeted, can we extend the grant to just those businesses? Um, and, and all those other options that we looked at, and you'll have seen the disadvantages, they, they often had gaps. There would have been a lot of companies who would not have, or lots of parts of the major sectors, such as larger hotels, for example, that would not have benefited from those if we had gone down in some of the other uh, routes. So um, I think the, the option that has been taken is the option that best targets those areas in need of most support. I have two follow well, if you've got several follow-up questions, if I may, Chair. But, um, First, were you, you, were you and the Policy Centre were involved in the, some of the initial advice even before this May 2020 paper, the sort of March era advice to the executive, was that right? No. No, we okay. weren't, no. Fine. Um, we, no, we did produce, a, we published a paper that was in the public domain. Yeah, but it, wasn't, it, it went yeah, into... It wasn't commissioned, was it? But No, it wasn't. Okay, fine, I think I saw that. Um, one of the reasons, understandably, one of the disadvantages listed is dead weight, there, i.e. the principle that you try and minimise the amount of economic activity that you're subsidising that doesn't need to be subsidised. Are you aware of any uh, analysis that's happened on, uh, of the, the dead weight of existing um, measures, as in the, you know, the, the, the dead weight that the it, dead weight for the existing were, programs? For existing that programs, yeah. Um, again, we haven't um, we haven't done any specific research on that. Yeah. Um, I, I think what I would say is that. Has there been dead weight in some of those programmes? Undoubtedly, yeah. uh, mm. because um, the, the nature of whenever you give money to all businesses, for example, with an NAV below fifteen thousand yeah. pounds, um, some of them are going to need it, some of them aren't. Um, what I would say um, in, in defence, however, is that we were faced one with an un unprecedented mm -hmm. um, economic situation. And there was a, a need, a, an absolute need, to get money and relief That's, out yeah. of businesses very, very quickly. Completely agreed. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to. Uh, uh, dead weight is completely inevitable in that kind of intervention. Yes. I'm not, so I'm not trying to sort of label blame. I just wanted to know if there had been any uh, sort of analysis yet done Sorry, on the amount. Not that I, certainly not that we haven't mm -hmm. um, carried that out. We're doing other work to uh, to try to understand from businesses. The, uh, and this has just started, so I can't give you any headlines, I'm afraid. Yeah, okay. um, but it's, it's to ask businesses uh, in terms of how effective they thought those existing uh, measures were, both the local measures and the right. national measures. Just then, on, on the, um, another document that has been created by, by the Department of Economy is the Rebuilding a Stronger Economy um, paper, which is about 14 pages long, but is, I think, what counts for a, a sort of recovery strategy thus far. Were you consulted on that? Did you feed into that document? Uh, we, we were not consulted specifically on that document. However, I do think some of our research is referenced in it. Sure. Um, do you think, I mean, in, that, in a sense that they set out some of the key challenges or some of the areas around the Northern Ireland economy that are completely, there's basically consensus that Northern Ireland is a low skills, low productivity, low investment economy, and it has been for decades. Um, is it a fair statement that all of those challenges are, or most of them are made worse by COVID-19? Undoubtedly, yes. So would you think, I'm sort of inviting you to agree with the statement that the, in a sense, the, 
the most important thing for the, you might not want to agree, but if you were designing the policy, would you say that the most important thing is that the response to COVID-19 has to, um, there's even more of an urgency on addressing these um, long-standing particular challenges. Just, thank you, okay. Just on, that, on FDI, on a particular point, coming on to another hobby horse of mine, you mentioned um, potential around FDI and moving certain types of manufacturing. Is there a, so you talked about essentially manufacturing back to, to, to China. Is there a risk that if we pursue that too much that we get back into a situation where effectively it's, it's creating, we're sort of prioritizing lower skills jobs now? I understand that, you know, in one sense, we need to create jobs. We're going to have a, uh, probably a jobs crisis in a few months, so we can't be, not, not everyone can be a research scientist. Um, but is there a risk that, in, for example, giving Invest NI a mandate to go out and try and get manufacturing back from China, that you, that you sort of lean into what's an existing weakness in the Northern Ireland economy, which is low, lower skills job, and that is in no way to um, underplay the importance of that kind of manufacturing or, or its... But do you see what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I understand the point, and I think it's a fair point that, that, that you're making. Um, what I would say is that, and, and we've done some, we've done quite a lot of skills research, and, um, and it was one of the points I'd made previously, is um, that one of the real benefits of manufacturing is that it does create jobs across the entire skill spectrum. So. When you think of manu well, when a lot of people think of manufacturing, they can sometimes think of uh, relatively low-skilled shop yeah. floor type work. And yes, there are those types of jobs, but there's also very high-skilled jobs within manufacturing. Now, it'll vary within subsectors of manufacturing, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I suppose one of the reasons that that I'm a particular fan of of manufacturing is that it does create those opportunities for everyone. We're creating jobs for all, rather than necessarily just the, the high skilled. Um, and, that is, and, to, and to go to your point, that is why I was also uh, said that you're know, going after the likes of Invest NI, going after cybersecurity, IT, you know, professional services type investment is also something that we should be supporting. Uh, so that we're creating, I suppose what I'm trying to say is we need to create jobs across the whole skill spectrum, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not just focus on, I work in a university, but not yeah. just focus on graduate type jobs. On the, um, I, I have two questions and then we'll hand over to, some, to someone else. I don't want to, I don't want to be dead weight on our uh, committee. Um, Never. On, what's that? Too late. Never. <laughs> Too late. Um, <laughs> uh, again on FDI, um, is there... Would you say we're we're awaiting lots of information on how the Ireland Protocol is going to be implemented, um, and ideally it'll be taken into the realms of um, uh, you know shouting about Brexit. Although I'm, I've done my fair share of shouting about Brexit, but is there a are there potential advantages in terms of if the Ireland Protocol is implemented in a way that is um, uh, practicable and um, uh, you know works? That that is a and a you know, makes the argument for the kind of FDI you're talking about because we will have effectively a uh, manufactured goods here will have access to both the European and UK single markets. Yeah, I mean, I think this can go one of two ways. Um, I, I think the upside, and we haven't done any work on this, and, and um, I would certainly highly recommend that the people with the appropriate expertise do do work on it. It can go one of two ways. Either A, we can be in a situation where Northern Ireland is both in the UK and access to the UK market and uh, very frictionless access to, I uh, don't like to use that word, sorry, <laughs> easy access to the European Union. So we're kind of in both and we could badge ourselves as, as being in both. Uh, that's, that's what we want. Um, if it doesn't work well, then we could be in a situation where we're not really in either. So there's this uh, barrier between Northern Ireland and GB, and then there's this barrier between Northern Ireland and the European Union. So putting in place uh, measures that, where we can be in both, as it were, is, is something that uh, we should be looking to do. I don't know what that looks like, but I think that's, there, should be, there should be people focusing on And one final question, Rosen Bonsinger, I could ask you a question all day, Gareth, but is around the question of investment. We have historically been a very low investment economy, and you talked about infrastructure investment. I agree with you on that. Um, 
Uh, have you looked at the structural challenge of low? You also talked about the importance of money that government spends. You may be aware we had the June monitoring round yesterday, and we have um, capital underspends. Not a dig at the finance ministers, not a dig at the finance department. This is a long-standing challenge. Do you think there? Have you done any work on the economic multiplier effect that would happen if our devolved institutions could get capital spending working and getting money out the door properly? Because it would seem to me to be, to be if we are handing back 100 million in capital to the Treasury every year, we are effectively handing back potential um, growth. Uh, I, we haven't done any calculations in terms of the money that's, that, that has been handed back, but the premise of your, the point that you're making is, is correct. Um, and we are entering a period now where it is likely that the private sector, it will all depend on, on what happens moving forward, but it's highly likely that the private sector will be somewhat reluctant to investment will be weaker in the pri large. private sector investment will be weaker Correct. therefore public sector investment so therefore we're important. entering an environment where uh, there's a, there's more onus on on the public sector to to pick up that slack usually whenever there is a risk associated with increased levels of public sector investment in that is there capacity within construction sector to be able to deliver value for money. So if the construction sector starts to see lots of additional projects yeah. uh, coming Would on stream. Would it be stream, fair to say you're a Keynesian economist? The, the price increases. <laughs> but um, what I, I, I think that if, if we are looking at a lower level of private sector investment, that creates additional capacity for uh, increased public sector uh, employment, or sorry, public sector investment, in, certainly in the medium term. Okay. Thanks very much, Lee. Melissa? Uh, thank you. Uh, and Matthew, I think you may have covered nearly every area where there's making notes Sorry, on as well too at the same time. Well, thank you, Lord, and Sean, you. You're very welcome here today as well. And uh, I thoroughly appreciate just uh, your comments on that. I'd like to make some just observations on what was that you had actually commented on there. Uh, you talked earlier on about the young demographics. Uh, which is very much a feature of the island of Ireland. I think we're the youngest population in the whole of Europe. Uh, and that where one can maximise on that is when, in fact, it is complemented by an educational system that ensures that uh, that young demographic uh, will fulfil its potential. Uh, and, and in another respect, then, too, by living here on the island of Ireland uh, as, sort of as, as a sword that works both ways, that for those that have been well educated and are young, uh, they tend to move whenever the opportunity isn't there for them. That's one of the underlying principles, again, for say, of economics in itself. And they always talk about the more able emigrating. But in this case, it's not just emigration from the north of Ireland, to say, to England or to America or Australia, but even to our neighbours in the Republic, where they're for much higher um, return and for work done, uh, nearly at all levels, uh, and probably greater opportunity as well too. So that's probably in many respects. Um, our main competitor uh, in respect of that young demographic here in the north of Ireland and something that we have to take on board and consider. Uh, and when we look then at that other um, side of the educational system whereby people are sort of underachieve, underachievers or the likes of it or maybe are not uh, acquiring qualification, it's then that you need to have in place uh, a system that uh, is creating an opportunity for them. Uh, very often it can be, we say, in the likes of uh, uh, other skills, i.e. construction and the likes of it. And I was a bit surprised if you said that we're uh, a relatively robust uh, construction sector here at the present time, because I never would have thought that, um, uh, if anything, uh, it probably is relatively weak in comparison to other economies and probably has been greatly uh, weakened now too as a result of COVID at the same time. And that will require uh, support uh, in order to ensure that it again too can emerge and uh, maybe realise its full potential. Um, that, and as you said there, like one of the underlying principles again of economics, say a quick way of getting the money out there is by the development of infrastructure. Even though the Greens, I'm sure, are not too happy about the likes of that, but I know that for uh, myself, living in West Tyrone, uh, as a major issue for us, in particular with the likes of the A5 and so on, which we do feel in many ways will open up the North West to allow it to again 
uh, realise its potential in contributing to the economy of the whole of this island, not just to the north of Ireland, but also to uh, Dublin as well. But the other part of infrastructure that is critical at the present time, uh, in fact, is that which is the development of the technology and broadband and all the facilities that actually go with that in, alert, in order to allow us to maximise the full potential of the digital economy in every respect. And in making this whole sort of tirade all together at the one time, really, uh, the point that I'm actually getting to on this, that we've all heard, you know, from the inception of, we'll say, COVID in many respects and the impact that that has had, not only in the way that we socialise, but in the way that we organise our economies and that as well too. And we keep hearing this message, we cannot continue doing that which we have always done. It's now time for change. And I do think that, you know, that that's where economists in that particular uh, should be providing that kind of support and information to government. And what way can we change that does take on board the development of a digital economy that allows it uh, for all of our citizens to be much more included, that can raise not only their capacity and ability, but ensure that the jobs that we're looking for are not the low-paid jobs. And that whenever people go out of Northern Ireland we say, to sell this country, that they're not guaranteeing the investors come to us because we're a low-wage economy. In fact, that's a very, very negative approach in many respects. Uh, but they're there, come to us because of this young population who are highly educated, i.e. the educational system to support that and that it has within its economy those structures that facilitate and support the multinationals, the multinationals that in many ways that have made such a contribution to uh, our neighbours in the 26 counties. And in fact, it's something of that nature we do need here. But one other point that I want to really get to as well on this, that, and you're quite right there, that uh, I was enjoying the conversation you see in terms of the production of uh, PPEs and so on and that whether or not we were going to go against the whole sort of uh, uh, economic principle of the global economy to the extent that we were not going to free trade anymore, that we were going to put in place barriers that was ensured that only we could produce PPEs. But I do think that for our own safety, our own safety, that we should encourage and government look to support uh, our producers that can diversify to allow them to continue doing the work that up until now they have been doing and, and that where it has been very successful and profitable for them, but that they as well at the same time can secure our safety in the future by the production of the likes of PPEs and that too. I know that's a whole long to add, but it's uh, a, a couple of brief just a comments in, uh, by way of response. Uh, first of all, to clarify my, my comments in, on the construction sector. Uh, Northern Ireland traditionally has a, a strong construction sector. I don't want to pretend for a second that it's strong today. It's obviously mm. had a very significant impact. Mm. Um, one of the things I think that, that really brought it to the fore was, what, in terms of construction, was uh, post the financial crisis, um, we saw a very significant um, reduction in construction activity in Northern Ireland. And as a result of that, a lot of the larger local construction companies were uh, bidding for and successfully bidding for, for work across the water. Uh, and that is something that had not happened on that scale prior to the financial crisis. Mm. And it's something that they've continued uh, or had continued um, since then. So we, we do have a, a strong, robust construction sector aside from this current uh, pandemic issue. The second thing I would say just uh, in, in terms of you know, what should we be doing, um, and it, it, it's actually in that in the, in the DFE, uh, the paper uh, is is around skills and skills development. And I suppose my simple message: we we've done a lot of work around this, and I get we have we, we have an education. I suppose that there's an issue in terms of HE and FE in Northern Ireland, where. Um, some people will not go to FE because of the, and, and will go to HE because of, mm. of the grades to get into higher education, when actually FE would be a more appropriate route for them. Mm. But there's a status issue. And then similarly, there are, there are too many people in Northern Ireland who believe that HE isn't for them 
our family don't go to university and, and perhaps cut off what would be a very um, appropriate um, education route for them. And, and we, we noticed that, we in Ulster University noticed that in the Greater Belfast development, where some of the surrounding areas, a lot of the population university was something for someone else. So there's a cultural wall or walls that we need to break down between FE and HE and, and what's suitable for uh, people should be choosing the route that is that best delivers the economic outcome or the employment outcome uh, for, for them. The other thing I would say quite simply is uh, our message to young people has this year is if you were going to, there's 25,000 people roughly leave education, school, college, university each year to move into the labour market. There aren't going to be 25,000 jobs for them this year. Upskill. Stay in education. Upskill. Stay in education. Move up the qualifications ladder. Um, and, and that's across the piece. If you were going to you know, uh, leave with a level two or a level three qualification, go for, for level four. If, you're, if you've just graduated, go for a master's. And that should help because Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland labour market has a lower level of qualifications than, uh, than the UK average. So encouraging people to stay in education, particularly this year, be, um, is, uh, is vitally important. It will not only keep them off the unemployment register, but could help their employability in, in the longer term. Well, uh, having spent 30 odd years on education myself and, and FE, I know exactly what it is that you're talking about there. Uh, and in particular, I worked with the underachievers, or what mm -hmm. used to be described, and I found it nearly offensive even, as the bottom quartile. Uh, and that uh, I know exactly what you mean whenever you say it to them. Stay in education. But one thing that, that actually requires as well, too, one of the reasons why people left education years ago very, very often was because of the fact they couldn't afford to stay in education. They needed the money in the home or whatever, and they had to leave school early, some of them as early as 14 at a time. And the same principle applies as well, too. Uh, young people can stay in education if, in fact, um, it isn't what they're going to achieve in the long run, but that at least they're sustained while staying there, and that would require some kind of decision or support from government as well, too. Uh, and just one other area that I wanted to comment on, and uh, this again, too, has its implications for education and skills and training. And as our chair had noted there in West Tyrone, in fact, in the east of Tyrone, uh, as of anything, maybe the manufacturing heart now of the north of Ireland, given the amount of different manufacturing industries that you have there. But even where I live uh, in the far west, in the Derg Valley, uh, it's, um, it was a surprise to Derry City and Stabane Council that they were the one area that, more so than anywhere else at this time, where uh, small to medium-sized enterprises were actually sprouting up in terms of manufacturing. And these were very, very often local people coming up with an idea themselves and maybe starting off in their own garage or their own backyard or whatever, and eventually uh, getting to the stage that we're buying. And, and I know that in the case of one of the firms, they actually export the import from Dalian in China and they export then to the rest of the world, having dealt with uh, raw material in Castle there. And uh, as that element within the economy here, uh, in the north of Ireland, that I do think that in many ways, you know, like that um, will prove even uh, in a new approach, probably of anything, the most productive sector, we'll say, within our economy, and that that, again, too, should be supported uh, by government in particular. And to date, that support was coming not just from our own local government, but in particular from uh, Europe. And uh, it's one of the concerns that we have that whether or not that continuing type of support will still exist after January the 1st. But uh, that's something we all have to work on. Okay. Chair, I would just say, just in the interest of total transparency, I'm also currently the temporary chair of CERC, the South Eastern Regional College, so I'm very aware of the very good work that FE does. Excellent. In addition to working in You've got your point, it's on and answered. Uh, I've got Two, um, we've got two more speakers to come, and I'm conscious of the time, and I'm conscious of your time of year in Gareth as well. So and I don't normally encourage people to this, but on, on we, we've got a drop dead time. We have to be out of here by, which is quite unusual, but I'll just do that. Uh, Jim, you're next, and then uh, can I just a quick, short quick one? I'm, I'm abusing my, my membership yeah. here, but it's just a, bit of a very quick question I want to follow. Yeah. Just two very quick points. When I read a report which says produced in partnership with a department, it always raises a flag with me about the independence 
of that report, uh, whether or not it is shaped to please or whether indeed it is shaped by the department and given the credibility of the cloak of the academic. How would you disabuse me of that? So um, we, uh, we we work with the we work with the Department of Finance and the Department for the Economy primarily in giving advice to um, to help shape and form economic policy. Um, I would, in terms of how how would I suggest? I think in Northern Ireland we are much better at articulating the problem than articulating the solution. And in the Economic Policy Centre, one of the things that we always try to do is focus. If, if we are going to be critical, then be critical and focus, uh, but focus on a solution uh, to, to solve the, the underlying problem. Uh, sometimes we undertake projects, research, that give the answer that the minister wants, and he or she is very happy. And sometimes we undertake a research project that, and, and the findings are not consistent with what the um, the minister wants. Um, and that is the nature Which of is research. Um, I th well, they got. It, well, you've seen the conclusions of my report, and that's broadly consistent with the. Um, the, the 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 policy measure that they put in place. So um, I I don't I think that this is a well. First of all, for the record, it is an independent piece. I was never at any point told what to what to say or what the right answer was. Um, so I was um, and it it was only after. I had undertaken the research that I had undertaken and provided my briefing that the policy was then developed. Um, so I would, um, I, I'm conscious that we work closely with uh, departmental officials. Um, possibly we work more closely with departmental officials than um, other researchers. Um, but that is, I would say, um, that gives us a greater influence over the policy measures that they put in place. Well, let me move. I'll not be tempted to come back on that, but let me um, move on to another subject. The new owners of Right Bus, in my constituency, are seeking to lobby the executive very hard about seeing, getting a vision for hydrogen hub and hydrogen as a fuel going forward. Have you or anyone else done any work on that field, or have you any view upon that? Um, we haven't done any work on it. Um, I do think that one of the outcomes um, of, of this pandemic is, and this is a, a global uh, outcome, is this trend towards a a greener, more environmentally friendly uh, economy, this zero carbon uh, uh, economy. And therefore, I think that the, the drive for research in that area uh, is something that would be consistent with that broader global trend. Is there a danger we could be left behind? Germany and others seem to be already well down the track. Um, Potentially, we could have been there. Well, there will be parts of the world that will be further uh, ahead of us in in certain areas of uh, research and development. That doesn't or shouldn't suggest that we therefore leave the field to them. Indeed, I'll leave it there. Thank okay. You. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Gemma. Most of my things have actually been covered by Malaysia, <laughs> but I just have one. Um, the area of concern you mentioned, you know, about staying in education, and then Malaysia mentioned about the funding, which was another thing that I was worried about. But obviously, I'm not long out of the education system myself. If you go for a job and you might have your master's or even a PhD, you don't have any experience. So they're looking for a young person with 40 years' experience. Is there any way around that, or is there any advice you could give 
young people now? Uh, yes, so I um, I speak at schools. So I, I talk to to schools and students in in terms of um, making uh, and, and giving career advice. One of the things that I tell uh, school pupils is that when they're choosing a, um, a, a a degree course, if that's the route that they want to take, that they should almost definitely choose a degree course that has a placement opportunity. Yeah. And one of the things that we notice more generally, um, it, where skills programmes are more successful, is where the, the skills development activity is undertaken in, in partnership with an education institution and an employer. Mm -hmm. So it's not just classroom learning. Yeah. It is. It combines the sort of the theory classroom learning with the practical uh, workplace learning. So um, my yeah, and, and whenever we look at uh, programs such as apprenticeship programs uh, that do combine those uh, both the, the classroom and workplace uh, learning, those are the programs that tend to deliver the the best skills development and employment outcomes for uh, for young people. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Gemma. Sean? Thanks, Chair. Um, a quick point, um, Gareth. One of the things going forward, you know, the policy debate will be, uh, as you put the emphasis on, was investment, spending versus austerity. I just wanted your opinion on that. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly the, um, the, 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 the government uh, response to the financial crisis, and, and this is more or less the global government response, you know, Western Europe, the US, was very quickly to move to uh, let's get the deficit under control, and so there was always control on government spending. Um, I think for various reasons that uh, fiscal policy response of the financial crisis will not be repeated mm -hmm. in the coronavirus response. Um, I think that brings with it certainly some short-term advantages, uh, you know, in, in terms of taking away the worst of the impacts of the um, uh, of this uh, pandemic and, and lockdown period. Um, however, in, in the longer term, you just can't keep borrowing indefinitely, and there is evidence that shows you know, countries with higher levels of public debt um, have long-term lower growth than, than economies that have lower levels of, of, of public debt. That's unless, of course, you're the United States. Um, well, the other, I mean, <laughs> in terms of um, the, the affordability of this borrowing and ongoing basis, it, it's currently being largely funded by central bank balance sheets, mm -hmm. by quantitative easing. Um, that's that is, and the, and the Bank of England will admit this. Central bankers around the world will, will admit this. This is still a this is still an experiment that we're in from yeah. the financial crisis, and the long-term implications of that have yet to be uh, have yet to be experienced. So, um, yet yeah, clearly, the, uh, austerity policy or uh, austerity policies um, would uh, would be what we call pro-cyclical, so they would uh, exacerbate the issues that we're currently facing. But in in the longer term, um, I do think that governments will either a have to make some measures to control spending, and or uh, b increase taxes. Um, and what I would say, you know, when I look back the last forty years, and again, this is a global sort of Western European, Northern American trend. We have seen a trend towards lower taxes and controlling government spending. It hasn't been a straight line down, but that's all, that's been the long-term trend over the last 40 years. I think we could be at an inflection point here, where I think in in the longer term, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now, we will have higher levels of government spending and higher taxes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. back to Bretton Woods even. Um, okay. A, very short one. Thank you. Short, cheers. Thank you, Chair. I will be very quick. Very quick. Um, you mentioned in your answer to Melissa uh, this question about state, almost sort of uh, a particular problem here around s s people thinking about higher education, further education in a way sort of slightly status obsessed. Have you? Is there a particular work done on that? And is it? Um, 
have you done any particular work on that? I suppose is, is, there, is there an economic underpinning to that opinion? Okay. Um, <laughs> there isn't an economic underpinning. It is a an observation. For a, let me give you an example. Uh, it, not in Cirque, uh, but in another FE college. I, I'm aware that a a school invited in representatives, yeah. a grammar school invited in representatives from uh, the FE sector to talk to uh, their pupils as, a, as an option. Uh, the following day, the principal was inundated with uh, complaints from parents. This is an anecdote, but this is, this is happening across the piece. And so FE colleges find it very difficult to get into some areas. And it's not restricted to grammar schools, I have to say, because some of the high schools are also wanting to retain their pupils. It's connected to that, and I will be very brief. I don't know if you've looked, have you, you, I presume you have looked at the papers done by Fitzgerald and Morganroth um, at Trinity on long-term issues with our economy. Some of them chime with what the work you've done. Do you think there is an issue that, do you think there's a linkage between high migration, which they talk about, which is a, a story that is, you know, connected to the history of this island, but is very particular to Northern Ireland Islands in particular. Is there a connection between high emigration, the state of our HE sector, uh, a slight kind of social stigma around FE? Um, to me, those things seem connected. I think there's a, there, there's a, a, a broader story there. And so is that something you would agree with? Um, I mean, certainly yes, but I think, <coughs> uh, in, in terms of what you're saying. But um, in terms of the, the numbers of young people who leave Northern Ireland to, to study, whether it's primarily across the water or, or elsewhere in, in HE, I think we have to recognise Northern Ireland's a small place, um, and uh, it's, it's quite normal for young people, and it's good for young people to get uh, broaden their horizons, get broader exposure to, uh, even if it's just a marginally different uh, culture. So I think there, there it's, I would not want to discourage young people from travelling overseas to education. Um, I think the, the trick is getting them back. Yeah. Um, and it's, so we're losing a significant proportion of our of our brightest. But is there also the trick? I mean, if you look I think at that, uh, we're we'll we'll follow it up. I think, sure I think we've got some more. But Gareth, thank you very much indeed. You're and welcome. yeah, sometimes it takes 30 years to get them back, but I came back after 30 years, so I don't know if that's <laughs> a strength or a weakness. But Gareth, thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for the evidence you give, and I think you have the appreciation of the committee. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Okay, team. Next up is the oral evidence, um, the rates, coronavirus, emergency relief, number two regulations, uh, Northern Ireland 2020 rating policy division from the Department of Finance. Alan and Andrew, uh, I'm supposed to say you're on the spotlight. I've got one of you on the spotlight. I don't know where the other one is. Yeah. Good afternoon. I apologise for the, the slight late, but I think we had some. You were able to listen to some very interesting sort of evidence that then was given in front of us. Um, the relevant papers relating to this agenda item are as follows. The clerk's briefing note on the SL1 uh, on page 430, uh, the SL1 itself on page 432, and the Committee of the Economy seeking clarification if the SR would cover a number of listed areas grouped uh, tabled at page 65. <coughs> Excuse me. This SL1 was considered by the Committee on the 24th of June with the purpose to make provisions to provide emergency rate relief in order to help business rate payers who are facing financial impacts or raising for COVID. Uh, for members, there are a number of questions surrounding the SL1. I advise members this is the committee's opportunity to ensure that it is satisfied with the support provided through rates relief as appropriate. And uh, invite questions from the members. Or would you, uh, would Alan and Andrew, would you like to make some uh, opening remarks and then we can get stuck in, or are you quite happy to take questions? Your type for time, Chair. So we're happy to go. You go ahead. Okay. Uh, just some I need to do. Uh, one of the questions we have: we're seeking clarification. And this was requested by the Committee for the Economy on whether the measures in the final SR will cover golf and yacht clubs, the premises of bus and coach tour operators, leisure and family entertainment complex, and multi-site petrol stations and/or supermarket premises. Have you got all that list? Yeah, well, in, in terms of yes, all sports sports facilities would certainly be covered under under leisure. Um, in terms of um, petrol station, uh, four courts, uh, supermarket. Does, does, does that include, does, is that golf clubs and uh, is that golf clubs and yacht clubs are considered as sports? Are they? Yes. Yes. Yep. Um, they will. They will be. 
already um, they would already be getting sport and recreation relief. Um, certainly, where the where the yacht club's got a premises in which it's being used for the sport, there'll be the storing of yachts and equipment and and, and, and issues like that. But yes, that will be within the the leisure uh, facility. What we're trying to do very much is align. Um, the regulations with the regulations that are in place in Scotland for very, very similar scheme and also the advisory um, um, papers that are published for England and separately for Wales. So we have drawn very closely um, to seek to align where the policy intention is the same. Um, in terms of, uh, yes, the multi, the, the, the four course, again, where there, um, it's retail, um, selling a petrol is retail, there's a retail shop there. So it will come under the general re re uh, retail relief. The only thing I would say is where um, it falls within the sort of medium to large supermarket class, there may be some very few that might find uh, the, the exception that the minister uh, said. Um, we haven't finally drawn, known where to draw the line there, but in terms of uh, the policy intention is to exclude medium to large food supermarkets um and but generally speaking um most of those small as uh, small garage supermarkets will not where they will get relief um remind me chair of the other ones what was the uh, other list it was premises of bus and coach tour operators um i i, I th at that stage i don't think so um because well it depends what really uh the the premises are being used for the storing of the the bus or coach that that they might not fall in within the the, the, the uh, relief. Certainly, where you have the the retail unit, where uh, they're selling of the of tickets or selling of tours, that's that's retail. Um, but the storage of the storage of the bus or the storage of the coach uh, might might not. It it will really some of those will have to be judged on a case by case basis. Yeah, and the other one we had was family entertainment complexes. Yes, the quick answer to that is yes, that's within the leisure yep. category. Yeah, be covered. Okay, thank you. That's up. what we need to answer for the. Yeah, okay, thanks very much today. Uh, Matthew? Oh, thank you, um, Chair. Can, um, and thanks both for, for coming. Can I just ask, first of all, um, for the question I asked Gareth Hetherington, um, what's, what's the estimate of the dead weight in relation to this, uh, these measures? I mean, I presume you have a. Do you, whether you have a, a kind of. Um, a uh, percentage of recipients, or a um, or a kind of million, you know, millions of pounds in terms of foregone revenue. Do you have? Could you have that number? Not really. No, we 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 really just. But we'd have agree with the comment early on. You know, the rating system is a very blunt instrument, and what we were trying to do, and and the discussion with Gareth was remove the the burden of rates um, uh, from a, a, a fast sector. We couldn't get into. Uh, you know, there will be certainly there will be retail shops there that don't actually need the, the business rates relief, but it is our call and, and Gareth's call that most do. Um, so at not this stage, uh, it's really, it would be not possible to, to, to make that. So I just clear. I think certainly, uh, certainly where the minister recognised uh, the, the two exceptions, one uh, was off licences. Yeah. Um, the second was medium to large food. So in a sense, there's a recognition there. <laughs> That's the dead that weight, basically. Sectors didn't need, but 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 yes, no, there is no doubt that there 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 will be people there that don't particularly need the yeah. relief. Um, and that's a, that's, a, that's an extension and really all we could do in the time available. So just to be clear, I'm sorry. That's the, 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 the I was asking Gareth sort of about the dead weight in the, in the initial few months of relief. But this is you're saying that it'll exist until March next year. And again, I'm not. I'm not looking to. I'm not saying it's necessarily a, a, an avoidable thing. Yeah, I mean, well, what we're what we're looking at is is really just till, till March of next year. Yeah, uh, we haven't looked beyond that in terms of this particular relief. Yeah. And and on the um, just on the re on the retail properties in terms of medium to large supermarkets, like what does that mean in terms of um, how that exemption works? Is there a, f a square footage? Um, that's applied with the average sort of small Tesco metro, not that our Tesco Express, not that I'm trying to name particular um, outlets, but would that would they be covered or exempt? Well, we, we, we would be well above the, right. the small metro shop. Um, this, that, that size is where we're actually trying to do. We've done considerable research. We've obviously got access to all the valuation records. Mm. 
Um, and I'm just trying to establish exactly where that line would be. Uh, yeah, I suspect that we will we will draft something which will describe the amount of retail uh, and the, the retail floor space, the retail part of the floor space in square yeah. meters. Um, but, but there is a wholly or mainly uh, aspect which we anticipate will be in the legislation. So it will be wholly or mainly uh, for the sale of food. We're, we're not interested. It's it's food food stores, not can, not not particularly just. Uh, confectionery and, and convenience, it's food stores. But we, there's no way of being certain at this stage that, for example, there wouldn't be a hypothetical, um, you know, one of the big multiples, uh, one of their stores that just happens to sneak in under the radar. There's no, that there's no, you can't be certain at this stage that there won't be one that um, just happens to get in. Well, I, I, we're, we're, not, we're not targeting particular occupiers, multinational or, or local. Um, we're, we're identifying medium to large. The minister, it's, minister's intention here is to uh, to exclude medium to large food stores. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm pretty confident that you know where we're going to draw the line uh, will certainly, therefore, exclude large supermarkets. Good. I'm also glad we're we're looking after both the haves and the have yachts in the um, when it comes to this rates. Really. <laughs> that is the worst pun all day. Right. Mm. Are you finished, Matthew? Is it? Gemma. That's me, Gemma. Yeah, thanks. Just a quick question. Um, does the exemption apply to the registered childminders who yeah. operate from their own home? Well, the registered childminder in their home wouldn't pay business rates, and this is the relief <laughs> of business rates. So if someone doesn't pay business rates, then um, they, there's no relief. You can't give relief to something that doesn't exist. So, um, no. Okay, thanks. A few unhappy childminders, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, it, well, it, well, you know, it, it, what we're, we're not doing here is we're not trying to widen the remit of business rates. Mm -hmm. um, what we're doing is trying to relieve the burden of business rates for those who currently pay. Yeah. So we are reducing the business rates from those who've got a business rates bill. Um, rather, we're not, we're not seeking to give someone a bill for business rates and then take away the relief. There, there are other... There are other this is a blunt instrument that is rates. There are many other grants and other issues and other support measures out there. Um, certainly in terms of the, the child care sector that was recognised within the report by Gareth. Um, and where there are where there are buildings that are paying business rates for, uh, for child care, then we're relieving them of the burden of business rates. But, but it can't go further than that. This is just business rates. Okay, thank you. Okay. Are we... Sorry, Paul. Yeah, just a very quick one. I know that... Um, and we would have said in here too that the taxation uh, system of rates is a blunt instrument, but I don't think that we should make light of the fact that this has greatly helped businesses this year. This is the difference between staying in business and not staying in business. Uh, you know, some businesses in my constituency were looking at losses of 130,000, have now are now looking at losses of 30,000. And that's the difference that this has has made. It it has been a game changer with regards to all the relief out there. Uh, so you know, whilst the taxation system's blunt, uh, the relief here is mighty, uh, and and we should, you know, we, we should be placed on record as as thanking the executive and indeed the finance minister for this relief. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's a lot of big figures being talked about these days. Um, but yeah, I, I think that you're right in highlighting that point. Three hundred and thirteen million pounds of rate relief is no small amount of money. Um, and I think as well, uh, if I can say that, although we're seeking to align in terms of the regulation and 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 a guidance uh, in, in terms of other parts of the UK, I think we in here made the right call in terms of the first four months, because in the first four months we gave rate relief to all businesses. Um, whereas um, the rest of the UK uh, uh, took the approach for the 12 months where we are now going in the last eight months. So I think we recognise that all businesses suffered in the first, were going to suffer in the first four months. So that's why the Minister announced that on the 17th of March. That So four months, uh, which are three months extended to four, it was very, very significant. So I, I agree with your, your point. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. Um... Alan, Andrew, anything further to say before we thank you? No, not for me. Okay.
So, um, obviously, then we're we're proceed uh, according to your your uh, with your decisions here on the, on this afternoon, um, and then we will proceed with the minister to finalise the drafting and, and, and delay the legislation. Yep, that's it. So, members, are we content? Therefore, if the members agree that the Committee for Finance has considered the Department of Finance's proposal for subordinate legislation, the rates, coronavirus, emergency relief, number two, regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. Are we content? Okay. Agreed. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, team. And that is the spotlight off, I think I'm supposed to say, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. And next up, subordinate legislation SR 2020-106, Census Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. I'd like to draw the members' attention to the following papers related to this agenda item. Uh, Clark's briefing note on page 436. Uh, the SR 2020-106, Census Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 on page 437. Uh, the purpose of the Census Regulation is to make provision for the operational arrangements and procedures necessary for the conduct of the 2021 census, prescribe the paper questionnaires and provide details of the various online questionnaires that will be used in schedules to the regulations. Regulations are subject to negative resolution procedure. The committee considered the SL1 in its meeting on the 17th of June and was content with the policy proposals. There have been no changes in policy, uh, in policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee. There are no issues raised at the meeting on the 17th of June. The examiner's statutory rules has not as yet reported on the statutory rule, and if agreed, it will be subject to the ESR's report. Uh, members, are we content? Therefore, the Committee for Finance has considered SR 2020-106, Census Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the ESR's report, has no objection to this rule. Are we content? Agreed. And next, moving on to subordinate legislation SR 2020 the rates exemption for automatic telling machines in rural areas, Order Northern Ireland 2020. Uh, the clerk's briefing notice on page 595. The rates order itself is on page 596. The statutory will, re will reinstate the previously applied rates exemption for separate entries in the valuation list associated with automatic telling machines in a designated rural area. The exemption will apply to any MTA any ATMs that are valued individually. This rule is subject to affirmative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The Committee considered the SL1 on its meeting on the 10th of June and was content with the policy proposals. There have been no changes in policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the Committee. The Examiner of Statutory Rules has not as yet reported on the statutory rule, although she has indicated she will not draw the special attention of the Assembly to the statutory rule. The ESR has indicated it will be in our next report prior to the 7th of July plenary, at which the statutory drill is scheduled to be considered. Members, are we content? Content. content. Members agree then that the Committee for Finance has considered the statutory drill 2021-10, the rates exemption for automatic telling machines in rural areas, Order Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the ESR report recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly. Are we content? Agreed. <coughs> right. Uh, item number nine, subordinate legislation SR 2020-111, the, the business tenancies coronavirus restriction of forfeiture relevant period Northern Ireland regulations 2020. Briefing notice at page 602, the statutory rules at page 603. I'd like to inform members while the Coronavirus Act 2020 provided that, where non-payment of rent would usually enable a landlord to treat a lease as forfeited that right would not be able to be exercised for a period of three months up to 30th of January 2020, with a part to extend if necessary. The purpose of the statutory rule is to extend that period in Northern Ireland until 30th September 2020. Okay. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The Committee considered the SL1 at its meeting on the 17th of June 2020 and was content with the policy proposals. There have been no changes in the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee. The examiner's statutory rules is not yet reported to this on the statutory rule. If agreed, the rule will be subject to the ESR's report. Do I have agreement from the committee? Yes. Therefore, the Committee of Finance has considered statutory rule 2020-111, the business tenancies coronavirus restriction of forfeiture relevant period Northern Ireland regulations 2020, and subject to the ESR's report has no objection to this rule. Content? Content. 
Uh, moving on to the chairperson's business, I touched on this before we uh, formally started the proceedings. The joint letter to the Treasury regarding timing of the UK budget. On the 21st of June, the clerk sought approval for the agreement of members to issue a joint letter to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury from the Chairs of the Finance Committee on the three devolved administrations. Uh, following members agreed, Gemma, Jim, Matthew, Paul, and myself, I just want your formal agreement for the purpose of recording the minutes to issue a joint letter to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury. Which Jim? Well, you, because I yeah. didn't. Uh... Oh, Jim Allister. Yeah, sorry. Never Apologies Jim. for that. Stop saying that. <laughs> yes. You're one of the cleverest people I know, Jim. You didn't mention, my name. You yeah. didn't mention my name there. Um, actually, your name's not down here, Melissa. Sorry, did you respond to that? I must have been a, just missed. Well, well, I'm Melissa's name too. Yeah. Yeah, so let's make sure we do that. And we'd also like agreement to forward the letter on to the minister in view of what the minister was stating. Are we content? Can I just... Yeah, um, just one quick point on that. It, it, now is probably the appropriate time to raise the chair for me. It's just on the fact that um, uh, the timing of the UK budget. So the letter has already been sent. This is the letter that's already yep. been sent by the, for the various chairs. Um, you'd have seen this day next week. Yeah, they're the, doing something called the summer as extra summer economic update. Uh, I presume that they'll, they'll take that. That will be for the Treasury a what, essentially a fis that would be a fiscal event. I presume. I, pres I haven't read much, but I presume they'll take the opportunity to produce new economic policy uh, and possibly even vary tax rates if they want to. So um, it is worth us thinking about whether, uh, given the, so the question, this is about the timing of the UK budget and the interplay between the block grant and the adjustment, do we need to follow up after that, after next week's document comes out? Well, indeed, um, and one of the things we might consider in the further work programme, we're scheduled for one more uh, a session. Uh, this before uh, recess, we might have to consider whether, depending on what happens, whether we look to have another session to consider this, because particularly if this deals with VAT changes, and I think that could be significant if the briefing that's been going behind the scenes recently that is looking along those lines, I think that would be appropriate. We might have to consider that. I presume there will be new. I mean, I would be amazed if there weren't new Barnet consequentials next oh, no, week. There's going to be. There's going to be. Yeah. And there's new Brilliant. Barnet consequentials must be coming from the Prime Minister's statement mm -hmm. about um, uh, an increasing in infrastructure in England. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not convinced about that. I think he was just reinforcing <laughs> money. Yeah. He said five billion. I think that was just money. He was already. Allow, allow me to say I'm being slight. I'm, I'm being hopeful that there might be more Barnet consequentials. No, I, rather than I personally don't think there was. was. I think that was agenda up to for a for a day for a um for a, a, I do I, I genuinely don't say that as a a, a political attack on on on. on I just said as a statement of that it seemed obvious to me there's no new money. Yeah, okay, I know. I did, I did say as in that. yesterday. There was no. okay. um, if we move on to other items of correspondence, uh, response from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission to follow up questions relating to the function of government bill, page 613, and from Felicity Houston regarding the function of government bill. Jim, would you like to say anything about that? Or are you content? No. Okay, um, we'll seek your agreement to consider further uh, as part of the scrutiny of the function in government bill. Are we content? Uh, the next item was the, from the Department of Finance regarding review of ALBs at page 625. I'd like to seek your agreement to forward to other statutory com uh, committees for information. Yep. Great. Uh, from the Department of Finance regarding sickness absence on the Northern Ireland Civil Service 2019-20, page 627. Um, we're beginning to get quite a body of evidence that's beginning to develop around the voluntary exit scheme and the implications it's had to the Northern Ireland Civil Service. And I think, speaking as the chairman, we're beginning to see evidence across all of the NICS of um, gaps in experience and levels and some problems that are beginning to develop. So I think as we look into the autumn, we should be considering this as we consider of, our, of us to uh, investigate and look at, because that comes within our department's remit. So, if you're content, I'd like to put that. Uh, I would like to put that, uh, put that in the public sector reform as part of the forward work program. If we're content, yeah. A department response regarding VAT and excise provisions on page 707. I advise the members of the department states that the Department of Economy is leading on this matter and has agreed to respond directly to the committee. Members, have we any comments? Are we content to note? Mm. <clears throat> A uh, departmental response regarding Council's post-COVID-19 social and economic recovery is page 708. Uh, I'd like to uh, seek your agreement to forward the response to Nilga and Solis. 
Yeah. Great. And from the Mineral Products Association, uh, uh, Northern Ireland, read the COVID-19 recovery. I'd like your uh, approval to forward that correspondence to the Department for comment on the 10 actions suggested by the uh, Mineral Products Association. Are we content? Yeah. Uh, departmental response regarding land registry fees on page 714. Uh, I would like to seek your agreement to forward that to the Public Accounts Committee to help inform its inquiry because they have taken that for action. Are we content? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll ask the members to content if we are content to note the remaining correspondence. <clears throat> Uh, the forward work program, uh, the updated forward work program, uh, is on page 730. Uh, I want to seek your agreement to uh, to take uh, oral evidence from the public spending director, Department of Finance, and your monitoring and the outcome of the June monitoring round during that period, so we can investigate that. And the other thing I need to do in the forward work program for that is we need to uh, investigate and discuss the emails. Are we content for the forward work program? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, any other business? I have two items to raise as part of any other business. Uh, the first one will get out of the way uh, fairly easily because I think we're not going to uh, we're not going to uh, contest this one. I would like, on behalf of the committee and as the chair, I'm going to write to the chief executive of the uh, National Crime Agency for the evidence we received on um, the briefing we received this morning. Uh, for those members who wasn't there, uh, and again, because this is uh, an open session, I won't go into a lot of details. But I think, and Melissa or Jim, you can sort of uh, come in on that. But I thought it was uh, it was much more informative, to put it mildly, than I thought it was going to be. Yep. And I thought it was um, of significant interest to this 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 committee. Absolutely. And yeah. it has enormous impl potentially enormous implications for Northern Ireland and the way we go forward. But I thought it would be appropriate if we write to the Chief Executive of the National Crime Agency for that, for facilitating that. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, second item of business is the emails. Uh, I, wished to, I was wishing to discuss these today, but I haven't actually seen them. Um, the emails, I believe, have been provided. Jim? Yes, sir. They arrived this morning at 9.18. Now, I, di I didn't get a, a look at the email that they arrived in until about 22 when I first noticed it. I, at that stage, I was preparing for the NCA briefing, but I did notice that it was, it, it came as quarantined because of the size of the file and the fact that it was zipped. So it took a long time to get that sorted out. Uh, so much so that it just got into the reissued table papers just prior to the meeting because I wanted to, to give members the opportunity to look at it. That only contains the non-confidential emails. There is another batch of confidential emails which I will have to look at and decide what marking to put on it before, before I put it in front of the committee. Right. So I think from uh, there is another issue here is that I was very surprised this morning to be rung up by a journalist and asking me what was in the details of the email because it appeared in the front page of the Irish News. And I haven't seen the email, so I can't comment on the specifics of what was the story within the Irish News. But it does seem to me and again, this is something we need to have a look at, is that these were protectively marked emails and we were informed by the minister mm -hmm. that they were of sufficient uh, degree of confidentiality, that they would only be released to us on a degree of confidence. And the fact that we haven't received them until nine o'clock this morning, but we're obviously in the domain of, e of journalists last night I think there is a substantial question we need to ask here of the Department of the Security and Control of its material. Sir, Chair, are you saying journalists have them? It's, it's the, Irish, the Irish News report this morning in the newspaper and online. It says it has seen the correspondence. And does that include the emails sent to us this morning? We don't, I, we don't know because I haven't, I haven't seen them. But there is an implication that they have seen, the, seen that information. Well, if so, that's quite shocking, but I think it's also quite unacceptable that knowing that this committee meets on Wednesday at lunchtime, that once more we got a last-minute communication. And I think there's design, not accident, in that. Uh, speaking as the Chair, um, there's two issues to this. One. To actually receive these emails at 9.15 this morning, so we haven't had the opportunity to consider them. 
regardless of whether we are, whatever our particular views of the email are, and we've been around this one back and forth lots and lots of times, the fact that it was delivered to this committee at 9.15 this morning in a zip file that made it difficult for us to actually access before this committee meeting, I think shows a degree of disrespect. And I am making that abundantly clear that I think that was disrespectful for this committee, regardless of what you think is in the emails. I have another further concern in that, bearing in mind the degree that we decided to accept listening to these emails and respecting the confidentiality of these emails, and the potential that those emails may already be within the domain of journalists who received it, obviously, before we even received the emails in the first place. I think I would like an explanation from the Permanent Secretary on how the control of this information has been handled, because I do not think this is acceptable. And regardless of your position on this, I think as members of a committee, for this information to be handled in this way, and bearing in mind the commitments we made to confidentiality to have this, I think this is something that is worthy, worthy of further investigation by the Department. And this has wider implications across all of government if this is the way this information is, is being released. Sir, John. Yeah, two quick points, uh, Chair. There's no evidence that they're in the public domain yet. We're making assumptions there. Secondly, emails were sent quarter past day. It's just a, a glitch that we have in them here. It would have been sufficient time for us to. Oh, sorry. Deputy, two, two points, Sean. Yeah. All the Okay. Paul. Oh. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I would agree with everything you say as Chair. Uh, there, is, there is this issue that, yes, we've got the emails. We're very thankful that we've got the emails. We will have a look at them. We won't let this drop. I have a number of issues. Uh, we only squeezed these emails out of the department because we noticed two days where there was no emails. But I'm going to go back now and look and see uh, with the index we have from the Freedom of Information BBC request, whether there may well be other emails missing from other days. So I think that's a job work we have to do, have to under, uh, undertake. But, but I, I agree, if the, if the Finance Committee has given an undertaking, that is a very serious thing. And there's honour involved here. And then if the whole email batch has been compromised before we have even had sight, I think that's something that we have to put on record now, because if they have been leaked by the department or someone within the department, well then it's not on the hands of this committee. And if, so, if, there is a, if there is a public discourse from here on in, it is not the fault of any single member of this committee, and I'm, I'm for the protection of every single member of this committee and, and the honour at stake here. Uh, can I commend the committee for the work they have done on something as simple as email trails that we have had to squeeze out of the department. Uh, it shouldn't have to be that way, but we have worked very tirelessly and very diligently on this to the point where we have received now additional information, uh, and that's a good thing. So I'd commend the committee for its perseverance in this. It shouldn't have to be the case, but we've had to do it. Uh, so yes, I agree with you. I think there's serious questions have arose then even today, and if there is journalists kicking about that have these emails, then I think that's a very serious question for the department, and we as a committee should ask for it. Um, just on another a note on this, um, for these, because I haven't had a chance to read the emails, oh. and I definitely haven't read the chance to read the confidential emails of that. For next week, and I would suggest we take this in, obviously, in closed session, the way we're, we're planning to do, I would like to ask Reyes to do a bit of work to track the emails that we've received, the emails that we have already previously received and against those lists of the emails that we know that came from the FOI request, so that Reyes actually can do a timeline, because, in fact, they might all be there, yeah. but we need to be able to see that in a degree, and I know that's probably a degree of work that... Uh, but, Chairman, Reyes might not be able to do it in the time available, but if we attempt to do it ourselves in the committee office first, would that... Oh, right, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry. I, that, that's, yeah. that's, sort of, that's, that's sort of what I meant, because I think we're, unless we're in a position to see the whole trail, we can't either put this to bed or raise other questions. Yeah. Sorry, Jim? Sure. I just want to say, I think we do have to pause and establish what was or wasn't in the Irish news before we rush to the conclusion that they have the emails we are talking about. All right. If they have correspondence 
between this committee and the department about why are we not getting these emails, that might be a different matter. But if they've actually got the emails before we had them, then that obviously is a very serious matter. The fact they would ever get them is a serious matter. I think we do need to establish what we're talking about with the Irish News before we jump in on that. Yep. Uh, Chair, I've already asked the Assistant Clerk to, to look at what was in the Irish News, compare it to what was in the non-confidential emails and the confidential emails, Thank so you. we should have that information next week. I think that would be appropriate. So the Irish News says, just for the sake of it, the detail of those emails expected to be passed to the committee that scrutinised the department on Wednesday have now been seen by the Irish News. It says they have been seen. Dear, dear. So well, if that's so, then I think it is a very Please serious... Chair. No, uh, Chair, do you know, uh, I just keep making the point, this is weary. Uh, and now, because it has appeared in the Irish News, it seems to be the case that it's making it more weary for me in particular uh, listen to the comment of this committee. Now, uh, it has been acknowledged that the emails and that there were received this morning and they happened to be in a zip file. It's not the first time I've come along to attend one of these meetings whenever I've had tabled papers as late as 12 o'clock in the day. It's not the first time that that's happened. That happens at every meeting that we attend. In fact, some of the table uh, papers we had today again too were arriving with me very, very late. Uh, and for us to then move from that position to sort of nearly imply uh, that the minister in some way is complicit for what is the Irish news or that in some way what's in the Irish news is... Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, no, just, just, just for the record, from Lisa, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, we're not making any implications at all. Well, we, know, we, know, we, know there's a, we know there's a story in the Irish news and we know we've been asking for these emails for weeks. Yes. Sorry, can I finish uh, just sharing this? And that uh, the request that was made to the Minister, he has responded to it. He's responded to a number of different occasions. On this occasion, I exactly sent a zip file as well, too, with all of the information in it that, as it was requested by this committee. And just as I had said uh, at our last meeting, I think it's time we drew a line onto this chair. And I really do think that it's time that, in your role, even as chair, you should be guiding our committee on to dealing with other matters that are much more critical uh, at the present time and in the pursuit of emails about an order that didn't exist, that didn't cost uh, anyone one single penny, but if anything was reflective of the endeavours of the Minister of Finance to assist the Minister of Health in achieving PPEs for all of our people. Uh, and we continue every single meeting that we attend with this particular issue. And let's just take the let's take the skin of the orange. Let's take the skin of the orange. This is about an attack on the minister and it's happening continuously. And any opportunity that one gets here, then some members are going to con going to continue to pursue that same particular issue. And that's exactly what that's about. You know that. I know that. Everyone on this committee knows that as well, too. Um, thank you very much indeed, and your comments are noted. But as the chair, I will make this abundantly clear. This is not an issue about attacking the minister. No. This is a question about openness and transparency. This is a question that goes to the heart of what we're trying to achieve in Northern Ireland. This is a question that goes to the heart of what's happened in RHI. This is a question that goes to the heart of what has been going on for the last three years when we didn't have an administration here. Now, the question I have as the chairman is for something that was supposedly so mundane and hasn't been a significant, wouldn't be a significant issue around PPE, for a department to not allow us access to those emails for the period of time we are at now seems absolutely inconceivable. So the question I have as a chairman, and indeed as a question as all MLAs you should be asking yourselves, is why? This is not a question of the finance minister. If this was any other department doing this, yeah. you would be asking the question time and again, why not? Yeah. And that is the reason why we need to do this, because this goes to the core of what the Northern Ireland Assembly is about or what it should be about. Thank you. Matthew, your comments. Uh, I'd be very brief. I, I, um, I, in a strange way, I, I kind of agree that we've spent far too much time talking about this because we've got lots of other stuff to scrutinise. Having said that, um, it can't be the case that... Um, uh, that there, this stuff can be in the paper and journalists can be scrutinising it. And indeed, I think the, the finance minister himself has talked about it at length to the Irish News, and it's in today's paper. So, with respect um, to colleagues, uh, while I agree that proportionately we have spent far too much of our time talking about this, it is also the case that 
the, a newspaper has these emails when we were told that they were confidential and the finance minister has given quotes. I have no interest in either, any kind of um, political agenda other than just you know, um, being fair about this. And I think the fact that um, what's in the paper today, is just, it's, it's simply just a, a question worth asking in a balanced way. Um, and as I said throughout, we spent too much time talking about this, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a case for legitimate scrutiny. That's all I would say. Okay. Right, through the chair, and can I come back to a point if when one talks about legitimate scrutiny? Uh, and at our last meeting, uh, once again, too, it nearly was being portrayed that in some respect that I wasn't interested in scrutiny by this committee. Mm. In fact, I am in every respect, and I think that that is uh, what our role is, and that we should be entitled to do that in every way. But in this case, once again, I'm saying that the actual emails that have arrived here, they arrived here this morning. They arrived this morning after nine o'clock, and yet and all, as I say, we haven't received them here at this committee. And in some way, that uh, it's nearly been implied that okay, that was why it was sent at nine o'clock this morning. Why did it not come yesterday, the day before? Oh, I do not know why. Not? But yeah, the very fact through, that it's in a zip file, through, through um, the, chair, through the, chair. the very fact that it's in a zip file in the first instance implies that there's quite a lot of information there. Uh, and that uh, I do think that uh, the minister has delivered as. It was requested of him by this committee. And again, I don't think for one second that either I or even any other member of my party is not concerned about scrutiny by this committee. And I think we should be scrutinising a whole lot of things, much more important at the present time than continuing going down this one particular role uh, in relation to emails. And I have questioned the motive of other peoples in, 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 in the pursuit of that. And I yet I sorry, just one point. Uh, again, Melissa, that is noted. And I think next week we will have the opportunity to look into this when we've got more information in front of us and look at this in some detail. However, there's one final comment I would like to make, and it refers to the media as well. Last week, there was reference made by a member of this committee about information appearing on the Nolan show or whatever particular show that there was. And I took that a degree of an objection, because the one thing this committee has committed itself is to the confidentiality of this information that's come through. To find that this information, as has been read out by another honourable member of this committee, has shown that these emails have found their way into the media, but not from a source within this committee, I think is particularly worrying. And I think every single member of this committee should sh express their concerns to that particular point. But we have, will have the opportunity next week after we have looked at this in some more detail. And indeed, we probably even have the chance to finish. Did Mr. Alistair want to That's right. No, it's okay. yeah. We even have the chance to finish. Sorry, sir, can, can I just uh, get clarity? Uh, you made a suggestion that an explanation be sought from the Permanent Secretary on how the control of this information has been handled, uh, especially considering how the Committee has agreed to handle the information in yeah. confidence. Yes. Is that agreed? Yeah. If it's in confidential, it hides the money to you. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a breach of um, information security. Yes. And indeed, the ITSO, uh, sorry, the IT security, the ITSO should be investigating that and reporting to it. Two separate issues, Chair. Two separate, and on, a, and on a, any other business. Uh, yep. two. First issue, the Minister stated yesterday to a question that I posed twice that the overcommitment is gone. I think the overcommitment of $100 million at a time is gone. Um, I think we should explore that further, um, because what we've had is a monitoring round. We haven't had any uh, Barnet consequentials or anything like that to, to supplement that over a commitment. So I think we have to ask the department uh, about the current status of the over commitment. And I'm not saying the minister's wrong or, or misled in any or way, shape or form. clarity, did he actually state that the over commitment had gone? It was a, well. It was a, it was an answer. No, it's sort of it was that's, an answer that's, of sorts, and it was in the heat of the, the yeah. chamber. So again, I, I think we need to get clarity because I, I took it that he said to me that the. I'm sure we could ask. I was sure we could ask through the day low what the yeah. question. Yeah. Do the chair? Do you mean the overcommitment to spending on rates relief? No. I, well, I, when I asked the question, it was the overcommitment of the overall budget. Which was, I think, a bigger. Was the on rates relief of the overcommitment? Was that was it not? Or was it have I missed, as in from earlier in the year? Whenever he said, I think it was a hundred million. 
Yeah, th through the, uh, sorry, just, just so clearly, and as you're passing it through the chair, the question was I think the Minister told us that there was an overcommitment of around about 100 million that they were going to have to find within the monitoring round. Yeah. But as I, and again, I wasn't quite clear on what the Minister said, whether that requirement had disappeared or within the June monitoring round, particularly with the underspend, I think it was 56 million and 20 million somewhere else, that that requirement had gone. But I didn't have clarity on that. So maybe that would be a question to, if you're content, we ask the Daylow on yeah, that one. Thank, thank, just in clarity, I'm not, I'm not accusing anybody, I'm just scrutinising. Yeah, uh, yeah. The other question is, the, the thing I raised about the, uh, the Scottish uh, procurement model that is now br brought into place, I think it's worth the committee looking at this. Uh, it's NHS Scotland and a number of Scottish-based companies, and within a month they have opened up a brand new clear supply line for PPE. Uh, it mentions one company here, but it then goes on to stress that there's other suppliers also involved. So I think it would be worth looking into that to see what work we could do in Northern Ireland. Can we raise that, bring that up with raise? And mm. I, I think one of the strange things is, is that geopolitics are about to impose themselves quite a lot on our supply lines with China. Yeah. And I think anybody has noticed what's happened in the last week. Uh, we're probably in within two weeks' time, we may be in an entirely different scenario. So that might be quite an interesting uh, point to bring up. So just for point. clarity, it's the buy and make strategy uh, for NHS Scotland. Okay. Uh, to the Chair, can I ask uh, if I had the wording of uh, the last proposal that you had made to the Secretary of the Committee? Sorry? I, I didn't get it clearly. The last? It's the last, the last item uh, that you were... Uh, I think you're right in two. About the overcommitment? The overcommitment? Over no. No, before that, about the just emails. Before that. Oh, it's just uh, seeking an explanation from the Permanent Secretary in relation to how the information got into the Irish News. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, our guest is still on the screen. No, it? no, it's not. It's, he's, no, it's, uh, oh, it's not. It's not. <laughs> no, right. That's it's Phil. All right. <laughs> Everybody wave at Phil. Oh, Hi, yes, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> right. In that case, um, date and place of next meeting, um, next Wednesday at 12.30 in the Senate Chamber. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program signed.